Hey guys, so my name is Thomas and this is my first stream. Uh, it's probably not going to go without a hitch. But what I'm going to be trying to do today is teaching the Arkham Horror LCG. And I'm using Tabletop Simulator on Steam, which is essentially a game that lets you play board games online with friends or by yourself, which is what I'm doing now. Uh, so Arkham Horror LCG is basically a card game and it's called a living card game. The reason that it's called that is because, it, unlike Magic the Gathering, for instance, which is a collectible card game, this game, you know exactly what you're going to get when you buy a card pack. Um, there's deluxe expansions and there's the small mythos packs as well. So, you already know what's in the pack that you're buying, which is a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing because you can plan ahead and try to make sure that you are getting exactly the cards that you want. And it's also a bad thing because, well, I mean, you always know what you're going to get. <laughs> so um, in Magic, sometimes you would open a booster pack and see something really rare or cool or valuable. Um, here, most of the cards are pretty much worth the same thing, and it's not a lot. But in Magic, you could technically buy a single booster pack and spend... I don't know, $5 or something, I don't know how much they're going for these days, and get a mythic rare card, something that's really valuable, maybe worth 30 40 or even way more uh, money than that. Um, so Arkham Horror uh, is a really cool game. Um, it's based on the Howard Phillips Lovecraft Cthulhu Mythos, and this is basically a collection of short stories written in the 1920s by... Howard Phillips Lovecraft. Now he was an amazing author and his short stories are dealing with a different kind of horror um, in the sense that his monsters aren't evil beings that are out to get humanity and they're trying to track you down and kill you. They are essentially indifferent to the existence of humanity and I think that makes them all the more scary. Um, so this game is very story driven. Um, what you're trying to do essentially is advance the act cards so there's usually one, two, or three cards of this, and you're trying to get through it faster than the agenda card advances, which is essentially the bad guys. So this thing is going to advance um, every turn, usually. And when it reaches this number, which is uh, three in this instance, it advances. So what happens then is you take the top card, you flip it, and you read the backside, which tells you what happens in the story, and then leads you on to the next one, which is right here. Uh, and this one is seven because it's going to be even worse when you flip it and that's why it takes more points to advance. But the first one is what we're starting with and the first act is what we're starting with too. It's the same idea here. So you're going to take the top one, flip it once you've advanced it. There are different ways of advancing these things though. So the way you would advance the act card is by placing clue tokens on top of it which you would be getting in game and I will get to that in a second. But this one advances on its own. So every turn, there's a phase called the Mythos phase. And every single round starts with the Mythos phase, except for the first one. So in the first round, you don't do a Mythos phase. But every other round, you do it, and you start the phase with it. And when you do, you place one Doom token, which is these ominous-looking, circly things here. And you place it on top of it, and then it now has one point, one Doom point on it. And that's one third of the way to three, which is really obvious, so pardon that. <laughs> but once you get three of these on here, that's when this thing advances immediately. Actually, my apologies, that's not true. It advances in the Mythos phase. One of the parts of the Mythos phase, after placing a Doom on the agenda, is advance the agenda if Doom threshold is satisfied. So, um... The act, on the other hand, unless otherwise specified, advances immediately as soon as you place the clue tokens on it. So the clue tokens are also placed on here, or this is the one of the instances where it is placed immediately on there. But in some cases, you would actually take the clue token for your investigator and place it on his card, where you can, at a later time, spend it on your own terms. In this instance, though, uh, you wouldn't be doing that because you just immediately place it on this agenda. Uh, sorry, act, and I will explain in a second why. Uh, another thing about this game that I should mention: this is the play area. So this is where locations are going to be placed, and this is one of them. So this is where you start off, and you have your two little investigator tokens um, 
to signify that that's where they are. Now, usually there's other areas, so there would be other areas surrounding this area, and they are all connected. Um, well, there's ways to get to each one of them, I should say, rather. But this one is, <clears throat> every area has a little symbol on the top left corner, and then on the bottom, where these little circles are, it has symbols for other areas that you can get to from this area. And I know it sounds a bit confusing, maybe, but I will get to that in a second and show you. This right here is different for every scenario, um, and it basically tells you what would happen if you were to draw these tokens from the bag. Uh, and that's another thing that I need to explain in a second. So this game does not use dice. Um, when you are doing skill checks, which are things that you will have to eventually um, deal with in this game, you will be drawing little tokens from this. It's supposed to be a bag, but it's a book in this instance. It works just as well. So when you're doing skill checks, so your investigator has all these stats. This is willpower, uh, lore, uh, strength, and evasion. Now, willpower is used for particular tests that you're using. Lore, amongst tests that you might be using lore for, is also used for investigating. And investigating is the one of the ways that you can get clue tokens in this game. And those are used for advancing your act, which is how you win. Um, strength is used for strength test and for combat as well. So you would be trying to fight with an investigator who has a high strength stat unless your investigator enables you to use one of their other stats to use for combat, which is also a possibility. Now, evasion is used for evading monsters, as well as there are certain tests that use this particular stat in order for you to see if you can ad advance from it in a favorable way. So, <clears throat> right now we're only starting with this area, and I will explain why. And these are the tokens here. So this is damage markers. Um, this is one horror damage. So in this game, you basically have health and sanity. And this is to signify your health. So let's say you would lose one health. You would place one little heart symbol thing on this guy. And that would mean that he has one damage. You can see his uh, total health is nine. And his total sanity is five. So he's a pretty sturdy guy. He can withstand a lot of damage. Um, Whereas other characters like the one I'm, the other one that I'm playing with right now, which is Daisy Walker, she is really good at investigating with a lore stat of five. Uh, she's not a very good fighter. She has a strength test uh, strength stat of two. Her willpower is decent at three, and evasion is well, it's pretty abhorrent. I mean, two is not that great. You will see why. I will tell you. Um, Another thing that I wanted to mention, so this is the investigator area, and these mats are, by the way, absolutely stunning. Um, this is uh, a mod for Tabletop Simulator, so it's not, um, it's not something that originally comes with the game. There is no DLC for this particular board game, or card game, I should say, that you can buy uh, normally, but it's a, it's a user-created mod, and it's free. So once you buy Tabletop Simulator, you can essentially get this thing and play Arkham Horror uh, for free. And uh, it's very well crafted. I mean, it's set up for four players, but technically you can make it for more if you copy and paste these things and maybe put another one here. As you can see, there's plenty of room to spare. Now these things over here, there are other scenarios. So these are all the scenarios right now for the game. Um, and basically, you would have to take stuff out of them and set them up here. Right now, uh, initially, you have this scenario, which is the Gathering. And it's the first scenario in the Night of the Zealot campaign um, set up already. So it's, it's already good to go, which is uh, really convenient. Normally, you'd have to do it on your own, which can be quite time consuming, but nowhere near as time consuming as actually doing it physically. Uh, oh, what else? Oh! So before I get into the game, and I'm going to be explaining things as I go, but before I get into it, I want to give a brief rundown of the round sequence and then also the potential actions that you can do as, a, as an investigator. So without the upkeep, this game is fairly simple. I mean, you do three of these things during your turn, and they will all be explained in a second. But first, let's go with the round sequences. So as I said before, the Mythos phase, which isn't happening uh, in the first round, is consisting of these th 
things, which the first of which is placing one doom on the agenda, which is the bad guy's story arc developing. So you generally want to avoid that. Um, and failing that, you want to make sure that you're advancing the act deck quicker than the agenda is advancing. Because while the agenda advances and these cards flip, bad, bad things happen. And you will probably see some of those bad things happen to me. And I will most likely lose this game. I don't win in this game a lot. And from the general feedback of other people, they don't either. So that could be a good or bad thing. Some people like, you know, are, or some people are gluttons for punishment, which I think is pretty fun sometimes, playing a difficult game that's brutally punishing. And then other people are really frustrated by it. But I mean, I guess it's an acquired taste. So... After placing a Doom on the agenda, you are then to check whether it says Advanced Agenda Doom Threshold is satisfied. So again, as explained before, that means that once you have three of the Doom tokens on this card, then this card advances, you flip it, you read what happens. Kind of a spoiler, shouldn't be doing that. And uh, then you move on to the next one. <clears throat> in some cases, there's only one uh, Agenda or Act card, but that's not going to happen in this scenario. So. I will explain that later if it surfaces in a, in a different um, scenario. And then the final part of the Mythos phase is each investigator draws one card from the top of the encounter deck. So that's something I didn't mention before. The encounter deck is different for every single scenario and it has nasty things, um, plot developments, uh, sometimes good things, but most of the time it's going to be either monsters or debilitating effects that occur during the game. And instead of showing it to you right now, I'm just going to do it during the game. Okay, so once the Mythos phase is over, you have the Investigation phase. Now this is the part of the game where the Investigators do their stuff. And like I said before, you have these list of actions to choose from. It says, each Investigator may take up to three actions during his or her turn. The actions that may be taken are... So that means that you can choose any three of these, and you can, of course do any one of them multiple times if you so choose. So you can technically, the first one is draw a card or gain one resource. And uh, mm, I forgot to mention resources. So these are resources and these are used to pay for things that you're gonna be drawing from your deck, which are weapons and skills and all kinds of other things. And this is essentially the in-game currency here. Um, it's used to pay for items that you're gonna be using. So, one of the actions is to take one of those, or draw one of the cards from your deck. Um, so basically you can do that two times or three times, or you can do that once and do another thing, maybe once or twice. Any combination of these things will do for your turn, but you can only do three unless you have something that enables you to do multiples. So, <clears throat> the second one is play an event or asset card from your hand, so you're going to be drawing cards from your deck and you're going to have them at your disposal but you have to pay for them and you have to play them in order to be able to use them in the game unless they're different types of cards that don't have to be played which we will deal with too but essentially most of the cards have to be played and that costs one action uh, certain cards have the fast de denomination which means that they don't cost an action to play and they're really useful sometimes the third one is activate a uh, arrow pointing right ability on a card and some actions or rather some items that you have um, have potential actions on them that can be activated by using one of your actions and that arrow signifies one of your actions so I will show you an example just because it's a lot simpler to actually see it than to explain it and okay so the fourth one here is move to a connecting location so as I told you before there's going to be different locations here, and you can technically, as an investigator, unless you are barred somehow or you are incapacitated, you can move between locations freely, and that is one of your actions if you choose to do that. Investigate your location. So I did mention this before, and investigations are you using your lore stat, which is that little book over there. Which this guy has three, which is pretty good, but it's no match for Daisy, who has a five. So they would be using their lore stat to investigate locations for clues and every almost every location is going to have clues on it the whole point of the game is for you to go to these locations and investigate 
grab the clues and eventually place them on the act or use them in a different way to advance your objectives. Uh, yeah, so that's investigate and you will see an example of it later too. Fight or engage an enemy at your location. So in this game, combat is a little bit different from most living card games. For instance, Lord of the Rings. In this game, when an enemy spawns in your location, you are already engaged with it no matter what, unless the enemy has a keyword which uh, is aloof, and aloof enemies don't engage you right away. They're lazy, I guess is the best way to put it. But usually they would show up and they would be engaged with you, which kind of makes sense. I mean, if an enemy shows up, they would look at you and immediately try and attack you or engage in combat. Um, so fighting would be you doing an attack on the enemy, which normally, under normal, normal circumstances, would be you using your strength stat to try and do damage to the enemy. And this is your strength here, the little fist. Um, she has a really abhorrent strength stat, so generally you don't really use Daisy for combat. She's an investigator, like an investigative investigator. <laughs> um, and so you also, as an investigator, have the opportunity to engage an enemy. So let's say... Let's say Daisy and Roland, which is this guy right here, are in the same location. Enemy shows up and engages Roland. If Daisy wants to fight the enemy, she can actually just declare a fight action against the enemy without having to engage it. And then what's good about that is you don't have to be engaged with an enemy to try and do damage to it. But the bad thing is if you miss, you actually hit Roland. So you hit the other investigator. So it's kind of a risky move. But when you're engaged with an enemy, so if Roland was engaged with an enemy, he can fight the enemy so he chooses um, any time. And the final action here is the evasion, and I mentioned that one before too. So you can attempt to evade an, an enemy engaged with you, and you would be using your evasion stat to try to bypass the enemy for that round. And what that would do is just basically buy you an extra round where the enemy is not engaged with you, so they would not be trying to attack you um, for that turn until the refresh phase when the enemies untap or you know stop becoming evaded essentially and then in the next round they're free to attack you again unless you invade the, evade them again now there's other card abilities such as the lightning symbol and the little circly arrow symbol and those abilities do not cost an action to activate and you will see some of those in the game and on the bottom here, it says, if you're engaged with an enemy and spend an action to do anything other than fight, evade, or activate a parley or resign ability, each enemy engaged with you makes an attack of opportunity. So this is one of the nasty components in this game. If you do anything other than try to fight, evade, or do these two special actions, which are not always available, the enemy actually takes a swipe at you. So you really have to think about what you're doing when you're engaged with an enemy. You can't really just be throwing down cards and playing weapons all the time, which normally you would want to do, um, especially because you don't know when enemies are going to show up. So during the Mythos phase, when you're drawing from the encounter deck, you could draw an enemy or you could draw a treachery, which are bad things that will happen to you. You don't know what it's going to be uh, normally, unless you have some kind of ability that permits you to actually look into it. But an enemy generally shows up in the most unexpected and inconvenient times. So it can be quite frantic, especially if you're not equipped with a weapon and a particularly nasty opponent shows up and you're forced to make do with whatever you have. Um, so playing a weapon in that instance would actually permit the enemy to attack you, which sometimes can be really detrimental. So that was the investigation phase, and now after the investigation phase, we move on to the enemy phase. So if there are enemies in play, the enemies with the hunter keyword move towards the nearest investigator. So that means that certain enemies in this game would be compelled to move locations to stalk you and follow you around. Enemies without the hunter keyword would generally stay in the area where they're at, so they would just be a menace in that particular location but hunter enemies would pursue you and they would move one space towards you every single enemy phase and then if they are if they are then in a location with an investigator they would then each of them attack the investigator they're engaged with if they're able 
And then the upkeep phase is the final phase in the game, or the round, I should say. You reset actions. So what that would mean is once you have done all three actions with your investigators, you flip this thing. That's a nice little black and white vintage thing to show that this guy is now exhausted and he's done all he could for that turn. You'd flip her as well. So these cards now, or sorry, these tokens are showing you that they are exhausted and they've done their three actions, but then once the upkeep phase comes around, they flip back again and they're refreshed. And then you ready all exhausted cards. That includes enemies as well and any other thing that gets exhausted. And then each investigator draws one card and gains one resource. So you would draw a card from your deck, which is right here. And then you would get one of these little crate tokens. You actually start with five. So you s both or every single investigator, unless they're debilitated by something, would start with five of these. And that's your starting money for the game. So I'm just going to set that up really quickly. <clears throat> and then you also draw, you draw five cards to start with. And we're going to do that in a second, but just want to make sure that I got through to all of these. Then once you've readied all the exhausted cards, you of course draw a card and gain a resource. And then each investigator checks hand size and you discard down to eight cards. So that means is you normally have a limit of eight cards that you could be holding in your hand during this game. And if you have more than eight cards, you would have to get rid of some of them in order to make sure that you have eight or less cards. Uh, you don't draw up to eight, unfortunately, unless you have something that enables you to draw, obviously. But that's pretty much the gist of it. I'm going to be explaining things that I'm doing as I'm doing the scenario itself. So this was just a brief run through. I'm going to leave this here just for reference. Not that I don't know the actions or the round sequence, but it might be helpful to refer to them as I'm showing it to you, um, just for the sake of explanation. Okay, so I think we're almost ready to begin. There are obviously some things I've forgotten right now, but I will get to them as we're playing through the game. So I'm going to draw Roland's starting hand, which is five cards. These are the standard decks, so they're the standard starting decks that are um, basically out of the core set and um, they're actually pretty good for this scenario although sometimes this scenario as well as the other two scenarios in this campaign can be brutally punishing depending on certain things like card draw and luck which I'm sure if you're an LCG uh, or a board game player you are familiar with that concept. Um, not the best starting hand, and uh, as a matter of fact, in this game, you have the option to mulligan, and mulligan means that you take your starting hand, put it back into the deck, and you draw a new starting hand. But we're not going to do that right now, because uh, it's a tutorial, and I think I could deal with these cards, maybe. Uh, I would like to have a weapon that's different than the knife, but maybe we'll draw one later, so... So that's Roland's starting hand. Normally, uh, in this game, you don't really have access to everyone's hand. So I wouldn't be... If I were to be playing with another person right now, which I'm not, and this is a solo game, I wouldn't be able to see their hand. They could tell me certain abilities that they have, or that they could potentially do to influence the game. But I think, according to the rules, at least for Lord of the Rings for sure, you are not able to specify what cards you have in your hand. But if you're playing solo, obviously you have to bypass that rule because you're the only one playing both investigators, which is what I'm doing right now. So <clears throat> this is our starting hands. Um, Daisy does not have a weapon, although her deck is certainly not stacked with weapons. Since she's not a fighter, she's more of a person that gets clues. And so is Roland in his own way. For instance, Roland's special ability is when he defeats an enemy, when he kills a bad guy, he discovers one clue at his location. So that's really useful because when there are clues here, you would normally have to investigate to get the clues. And that means you would have to pass a lore check. And if you don't do that, you don't, you don't, if you don't pass, then you don't get the investigator. Uh, no, sorry, you don't get the clue. Now, Roland's ability actually lets you get clue tokens in a different way, which is by killing enemies. And I think it's actually one of my favorite abilities in the game. Uh, Daisy's ability, she is a person who likes to have tomes, even in the Arkham universe, or uh, Arkham Horror Files, rather. Uh, her, She's a librarian in, uh, 
in the Orne Library in Miskatonic University, which is a fictional university in the Howard Phillips Lovecraft um, universe. And she, essentially, her ability is she can take an additional action during her turn, which can only be used on tome abilities. So she's going to have a bunch of really powerful tomes. Uh, she doesn't have any right now, so I can't really show you that without cheating. But Roland has one, so this is something that Daisy also has in her deck, um, in her starting deck as far as I know. And as you can see, we have the little arrow here, which, uh, if you will remember, is an action. So if you have this tome on here, <clears throat> and it occupies one of your hand slots, which I also neglected to mention. So in this game, <clears throat> you have a limited number of items that you can uh, have. Uh, you can you have two hand slots because you have two hands, so it's pretty self-explanatory. You can have an accessory, which is the necklace symbol. You can have two arcane items, which I uh, don't think I have any arcane items here. Or do I? Oh, <coughs> no. No arcane items to start with, so I can't demonstrate that right now. You have an armor slot, which is a really, really nice silhouette of a sweater. And then this guy that looks exactly like Roland is the ally slot so you can have one ally one armor two arcane things and two things in your hand one each so like i said the tome occupies one of your hand slots so if, you, if i were to play this tome it would go here and that would occupy one of my hands because i have to carry the book and then if i play the knife it would occupy my other hand so now both of my hands are full that means i cannot play any more cards <clears throat> uh, that occupy a hand slot without necessarily uh, getting rid of one of these. Okay, so we're almost ready. Okay, and we've started setting up. We've drawn our setup hands. We have our resources. So basically what I should be doing right now and what I'm going to be doing right now is reading the story for this game and I'm actually going to bring it up too so you can see it. So this is the campaign guide for the core set of the Arkham Horror card game and it gives you a little bit of flavor, uh, background story if you will on the game. Like I said the game is very story driven so all of the agenda cards as well as the act cards um, have story components on them, plot developments. And before you get into that, though, you actually are encouraged to read this part, which sets up the whole campaign and this particular scenario for you. And so without further ado, let's, let's read it. The Ghoul's Hunger, Friday, September 18th, 1925, Arkham, Massachusetts. It is the end of a long and abnormally hot summer. The first hints of autumn beckon, but a heavy heat persists, relentless. A silent, unspoken anger grips the town. Tempers are short, and in the last week alone, there have been numerous reports of townspeople coming to heated, violent blows with one another, one another over simple misunderstandings. And now, a call from James Hankerson. He claims to have found a dismembered body in his barn. Blaming the weather would be too easy. There is something wrong with this town. Not a whole lot this old soothsayer can do to stop the tide. My auguries indicate a small group of investigators will soon take note of these strange happenings and set forth to make things right. I'll be watching their progress, but I won't be holding my breath. So, uh, after this, it basically tells you what you need to do to set up for the scenario. Certain things like put certain cards aside in order to have access to them once the plot developments call for them, as well as setting up the chaos bag, which incidentally is another thing I forgot to tell you about. Uh, there's a lot of ground to cover here, so I apologize for leaving things out, but hey, better late than never. So, like I said before, I did mention that I think you don't use dice in this game, so when you do uh, skill checks, for instance, when you do a lore uh, test for investigating, or when you do a strength test for combat, willpower test for any reason, or an evasion test to evade an enemy, you would be pitting your stat number against the value of that test. So every test is going to have a value. Usually they're going to be pretty close to your stat, unless they're some kind of really, really difficult challenge when they will be far beyond these numbers. But they'll be close to this. <clears throat> so let's say, let's say that I would be fighting a monster with a strength test uh, value of 4. So that would mean that I have a value of 4, and in this game, if you match 
the if you match the test number with your stat, then you win. So you just have to match it or get something higher. But here is where there is kind of a complication. So you don't actually just use your stat for the for the tests. You also have to draw from this, well, it's a book, but it's supposed to be a bag. And in the bag, there are little tokens. I'm going to show you right now just so you get a better idea. So these tokens all have values on them. These values are unknown to us right now, unless you refer to this thing right here. And even this thing doesn't show all of them. But this one and this one are demonstrated in the rules. So basically, if you draw the red tentacle, your test fails immediately. It doesn't matter how much higher your, your stat is than the value of the test. You, It's like an instant fail. This one is generally good. And this one, uh, it's an elder sign symbol, if I'm not mistaken. And that one would be would be shown on your investigator card. Every investigator has a different effect for their elder sign symbol, or for the elder sign symbol that you draw from the chaos bag. In this particular instance, um, since there's no numerical modifier on that, if you draw the elder sign symbol here, it says the effect is plus one for each clue on your location. So what does that mean? That means that if there are clues at the location, these are the clues, then they would modify your stat that you are testing against the test by adding plus one to it for every single clue that is at the location. So that's generally a good thing. If there are no clues on the location, then it's just a zero because there's no plus one modifier. Um, and then the other ones here, like this one is a zero, which is pretty straightforward. If you draw it, your stat, or rather the value that is going up against the test is not modified. This one is a minus one. So there's quite a few of these. I think there's three. Yep, these are the three minus ones. They're pretty common and drawing them is obviously a bad thing, but it's nowhere near as bad as drawing this thing, for instance, or the red tentacle, which obviously is the worst thing you can draw. But this one is also pretty nasty. It's not the red tentacle, but it's a minus four. So let's, let's suppose that I was going up against a monster with a strength value of two with Roland. It would seem like a breeze since he's a four and that's two higher than the monster. But if you draw this, or even if you draw this, it's a minus three, which brings me down to one. So you would subtract this number from my stat. And obviously one is lower than two, which is the monster's value. And that would mean that I effectively lost that strength test or combat round. Um, now, as I said before, there's a different there's a different card like this for every scenario. And this one basically tells you what this symbol, which is the cultist symbol does. In this scenario, the cultist symbol, if you draw it from this book, it's a minus one, and if you fail, you take one horror as well. So it subtracts one from your value. And then if you fail the challenge because of that, or if you fail the challenge at all, then you take one horror, um, which is which is one of the tokens that impedes your sanity. Now the skull thing, which there's two of, is minus X, and X is the number of ghoul enemies at your location, which means that when there's gonna be ghoul enemies at the location, you're gonna be subtracting their number from your value in, during the test um, if you draw this red skull symbol. And then this tombstone thing, says minus two, if there's a ghoul enemy at your location, you take one damage as well. And that's pretty much means the same thing that, that the other ones did. You subtract two from your value. And then if, if there are ghouls at your location, you take one damage. <clears throat> so as far as I know, that's pretty much all of the basics we need to know. And I mean, I, I guess if you're tuning in late, you might've missed some of the things. Don't worry about it because we're gonna get around to showing them during the game anyways. And this, Hopefully it didn't bore you to death. Um, I just wanted to give a brief run through and now I think we're ready to begin the game. So, like I said, you skip the mythos phase. So there's no mythos phase this round because it's the first round. So we start with the investigator phase, investigation phase rather. So in this scenario, there's going to be monsters. I've played it before, so I, I kind of have a general idea of what I'm up against. So getting a weapon out is a good idea, which means that Roland is in this location right here, which means he's going to be wanting to equip himself with weapons before he ventures, but he cannot venture out right now anyways. And that's because I forgot to read the agenda and the act. 
and I'm sucking at this really badly right now. So, um, <laughs> yeah, a little addition to the original story that I read from the campaign log is this. So the agenda says, it is late at night, you are holed up in your study researching the bloody disappearances that have been taking place in the region. A few hours into the into your research, you hear the sound of strange chanting coming from your parlor down the hall. At the same time, you hear dirt churning as if something were digging beneath the floor, which I'm assuming is that rat-looking thing coming up in the bathroom floor. Well, that's pretty ominous. Um, and then... As you leap to investigate, the door to your study vanishes before your eyes, leaving behind only solid wall. You're trapped inside your study until you can find another way out. So that explains why there's only one location in the game right now. It's because you're stuck there, and it's your study in your house, and you cannot get out until... So when you, when you move into a location, which we haven't moved in here, but we are here, you flip this card, and there's a little lock symbol there to indicate that you don't know what's there until you get there. When you do get there, after I read the flavor text here, we're going to flip it. So the flavor text is, you've been investigating the strange events occurring in Arkham for several days now. Your desk is covered in newspaper articles, police reports, and witness accounts. So since we're here, uh, we flip this, and lo and behold, there is an automatic something that puts investigator tokens, um, clue tokens, on the location according to the investigator. So here... On the location card, once it's flipped, there are two values um, in addition to the geographical uh, parameters, which this one has none right now. This one here tells you how many clue tokens go on this card. And it has a two there, and then it has a little... Uh, what that is is the head of an investigator, and that's a symbol signifying the number of investigators, which is, in this instance, two. Because there's Roland and Daisy, so it says two times investigators. So that would mean four, so that would mean that this automatic mechanism is not geared for two players. So we need to grab two extra clues. And now it's set up the way it's meant to be. There's four on there, and it says two times investigators, which is four. Now the other value here, the black, well, white number with the black background, is the shroud value. Now the shroud value tells you what the value of the investigation test is going to be for this particular location, which is two. So as I said before, when you try and get the clue tokens, you have to investigate, which costs you an action under normal circumstances. And then when you investigate, you use your lore test, which is the little book there, and that's a three. You use your lore test and pit it up against the shroud value here. So right now, Roland, if he were to investigate, he would put a three up against the two, but of course, that's not the end of it, because then you have to draw from this book thing, and you could potentially draw something really nasty from there. So you could fail the test easily, even though you're one point ahead. And sometimes that can be quite infuriating. But let's let's not jinx ourselves ahead of time. Um, so for now, <clears throat> the door to your study has vanished, and that means we have these four clue tokens that we need to grab. The only way to get out of here is to place the clues on the act deck and then actually advance it, at which point, hopefully, the door will open or we will find a way out. I know we will, but, you know, let's just keep the suspense going, I guess. So, <clears throat> I haven't taken an action yet with Roland, and I'm going to have him go first. So in this game, you can also strategize and decide which of the investigators commits or goes first. So which of the investigators does their three actions first? In this case, I'm going to go with Roland. And so Roland... Roland can start by spending two resources. So this is my resource briefcase, wallet, pool, whatever. And I'm going to be spending one resource to get this knife out. So as I said before, you have to pay for the things that you have in your hand in order to be able to have them in the game. So this knife is worth nothing in your hand except for this little symbol here. And that's another thing I forgot to mention. So cards have two utilities in this game. One of them is the normal utility, which is to pay for them with the cost here. So this is the cost of what you have to pay to get this card out. So normally it's an asset, which means you would pay one and get it into your hand and have a knife and wield the knife in the game. Or 
if you're doing a test, so if you're doing one of the tests in the game, you could actually just use this symbol up here as a modifier for that test. So what does that mean? That means that if I were to be doing a strength test right now with Roland, instead of paying for this card and using it as the knife itself, I can just throw it down during the test for no cost whatsoever. So I don't pay the one in this instance. And I get a little boost of one strength, which is what this symbol here signifies, or icon, I should say. And that means it'll give me a plus one to my strength. So some of them actually have two values here. This one, um, besides being an event that you can pay one for, and then it does whatever it says here, you can use it during a willpower test or an evasion test, either or, and you can throw it down and you will boost your either your willpower or your evasion for that test. But, however, once you do that, if you use it to boost your stats, you don't pay for it, as I mentioned earlier, but you also waste the card, so it goes into your discard pile. So, in this game, as a result of this mechanic, you have to make some tough choices from time to time, because some of the cards are really good, but they also sometimes, you really just need that extra boost in order to overcome an obstacle, and then you feel compelled to throw it down and, and um, just give you that little nudge towards succeeding, hopefully. But then, of course, even then, it's not guaranteed. But, <clears throat> as I said before, I spent... Oh, yeah, I spent the one resource, and I'm putting the knife here. So Roland now is a knife, which is good. And the knife essentially does one of two things. So either you use the knife to fight, and that means you use this action which is a little arrow and then you fight and you would get plus one strength for this attack so this is an ongoing effect it's not temporary icon boost that i was talking about before it, what, as long as you have the knife in your hand you will always have this option which is when you're fighting you get plus one strength for this attack so if you're wielding a knife you're a little bit stronger than if you're not wielding a knife and so that's pretty self-explanatory but now there's another uh, way to wield the knife or rather use it and that is a different action you can do. Now if you discard the knife and use this action, you fight and you get a plus two strength for this attack, and this attack deals one extra damage. So normally if you conduct a successful attack against an enemy, you deal one damage in this game uh, right off the bat. That's the standard thing. But there are items, <clears throat> mostly weapons, that um, add plus one to your damage, or plus two, or sometimes considerably higher numbers than that, which are really useful, um, especially when dealing with big bad guys. In this instance, though, the maximum thing you can get out of this knife is a plus two strength and a plus one damage if you sacrifice it, so I'm assuming that that means you are throwing the knife at the enemy, which means that it's going to sink into it and not ever return into your hands. It doesn't really make sense, but it doesn't matter because suspension of disbelief is important especially when playing a game with monsters and all kinds of other supernatural things. So, he's got a knife. That was one of his actions. Um, this thing has a shroud value of 2, which is only one less than Roland's lore. So it's pretty evenly matched on terms of Law of Averages when it comes to drawing from the Chaos book. But what I'm trying to say here is that if you're doing a lore test and you're only one above the value that you need to match, your chances of passing the test are not very good because there are more negative modifiers in here than positive modifiers, which you probably saw if uh, you were looking when I was looking through the contents. So, however, at the same time, it is a priority to get out of this area and advance the act. So... For the sake of advancing the story and for the sake of using my actions wisely, I am going to investigate with Roland, which, as I mentioned before, investigation means that you are going to try to get one of these clue tokens and put them onto the act. <clears throat> so, I do have one card here that boosts my lore. Uh, which is the barricade. So if I choose to actually use it as just a lore boost, I could do that, but then I will not be able to use it as the barricade itself. I don't know if I'm prepared to do that yet. I'm not that desperate. So I'm going to leave it and take a big chance and just go with my standard statistic here, which is 3, to go up against the shroud value, which is 2. So I'm going to shuffle, even though I 
think I shuffled this already. So right now I have a three against a two. If I get equal to or higher on my stat than this number, that means I get one of the clues and place it on here. If I don't match it, and if I get something lower, then I have wasted an action. Nothing bad happens in this instance, but it's still pretty bad. I mean, you want to use your actions wisely in this game. So let's draw. It's a minus one. So that means you subtract the minus one from three, which is your, well, my lore stat. And that puts me at two. The shroud value is two. So that means I matched it, which means I succeeded in this test. And succeeding in the test bestows the spoil of one clue token placed on the act. So the act specifies that it needs to have two times investigators, clue tokens, number of clue tokens on it in order to advance. So we're a quarter of a way there because two times investigators, of course, means four. So we're a quarter of a way to advancing our act, which is pretty good. And Roland still has one action left. <clears throat> um, I think that I don't want to play any of these guys, do I? Hmm. No, I think I'm going to try and investigate again. Uh, push my luck a bit more. See if I can get this thing over with faster. So I'm going to shuffle and draw again. This time I get a plus one. There's only one plus one modifiers in there for good reason. The game doesn't really want you to succeed too easily. So we did get a plus one, which puts us at four, which is way higher than what we need, which is a two. So that means my gamble paid off. And now I have two clue tokens placed on the act. So we're halfway there, but now Roland is out of actions. He's exhausted. So he goes to sleep. Well, not really, but you know what I mean? He's done for the turn. And now Daisy is the next investigator to go. And she has a lower stat of five, which is absolutely astonishing, especially for investigation. But let's see if she also has certain things that I might want to play. So for instance, here's this card, which is really cool as well. So this card is an event. And this card, if you pay two, it's fast. And fast, as I mentioned before, means it doesn't cost an action to play. And you play it only during your turn. But as an event, it gets you to discover one clue at your location. What I'm uncertain of right now, and this is embarrassing because I'm trying to teach this game. It's been a while since I last played, to my defense, but uh, that's not a very, very good excuse. I don't know if during events you get the icon boost because some cards that are skills so let's say manual dexterity for instance if you play this card you notice there is no cost so because there's no cost it's just a skill card that you play to get these icon boosts but skills are unique in that when you get the icon boost so you would get the two evasion stat points added to your test you also get the benefits written in the text box but you know what i just figured out Actually, now I understand the difference. So if it's an event and it has a cost, you don't get the icon boosts unless you use them specifically as a stat boost. So we cleared that mystery up really quickly, thankfully. I really didn't want to uh, make a fool of myself right now. So hopefully I've, I've avoided that. But basically, it's still really useful because it doesn't cost an action to play. And if I pay two resources from Daisy's pool, I get a clue at my location, no questions asked which could potentially mean that I could grab these two clues by just doing a single action of investigation if I succeed. So we'll keep that in mind for now. It's pretty useful. Um, do I want to play any of these? Sure, why not? In fact, I think that I'm going to spend two resources right off the bat to play the flashlight. So the flashlight obviously occupies one of your hand slots because you can't really balance it on your head, nor can you hold it in your mouth. Well, not actually, yet. that would be possible, I think, uh, technically, but you're, you can do it in this game. In this game, you have to carry the flashlight in your hands, and if you turn it on, you are using up batteries because flashlights do run on batteries. They're, they're not uh, self-sustaining. So we have three resource tokens on here to signify the three supplies, it has three uses. 
That means three units of battery life on this particular flashlight. So every time you would use this action, which is the little arrow symbol there, um, so it says spend one supply, investigate. So it would result in investigation action. And then your location gets minus two shroud for this investigation, which is actually super useful. So you see how we dealt with the shroud value before? What was the two? If you were to use one of the units of battery on the flashlight to use this action, you would subtract two from the shroud value, which would put it at a zero. So going up against a shroud value of zero with a lower stat of five is obviously incredibly favorable. Even if you were to draw the minus four token from here, which there is one, you would still be at a one against a zero. So that would put you into the success zone. However, there is still the red tentacle thing that you could draw, and that would be an instant fail, no matter how much advantage you have. So, um, anyway, this puts Daisy in a pretty favorable position in the sense that she now has the flashlight as well as a really high lore stat to investigate with. And I think I'm, I'm gonna do that right off the bat. I'm gonna have her investigate. So her second action, because her first action was getting the flashlight out. Unfortunately, that costs an action too. I'm gonna spend one of the batteries to investigate, put my five lore against a shroud of zero because of the flashlight, and let's draw from the chaos bag. This is a red skull, which is not as bad as the red tentacle. <clears throat> the red skull is minus X. X is the number of ghoul enemies at your location, which is conveniently zero right now. So that would mean this little skull goes back and I have wildly succeeded in this test, placing these things here. Well, that thing there, I mean. <laughs> and where am I going? Now, as my, th no, actually this doesn't cost an action. It's fast. So I pay the two resources, one, two, and throw this card onto the playmat, which means play only during your turn and you discover one clue at your location. So I don't have to do test this time because this card just got me my last clue. That means I put it on here. So now we look at the number of clues and we see that it's four, which is how much it takes to advance. So unlike the agenda, the act, advances whenever the players want it to. And I happen to know that it's good to advance it right away in this instance. So it's usually good to advance it right away in every instance. Although uh, I'd rather you not quote me on that because in some instances that might bring about an enemy that you may not be ready for at the time. But right now, I think we're good. So we're gonna delete these clues, two, three, four, because we don't need them anymore. And we're gonna flip this card. You notice that the edges of your newly purchased rug are tattered and mud-stained. Finding this odd, you shift the furniture aside and pull back the rug. To your surprise, you see the door leading out of your study under the rug. Well, that's a really messed up layout. You slowly turn the knob and the door swings open, revealing your hallway below. You jump through the doorway, landing on your feet on soft dirt. The door to the study slams shut above you. The smell of burning wood fills the narrow hall, intermingled with the scent of rot and decay. Put into play the set-aside hallway, cellar, attic, and parlor. So now, <clears throat> you might be wondering what these cards were for. Well, they were set aside in the beginning of the game, and they were set aside for the purpose of putting them into the game conveniently once these agenda and act cards call for them, and this is one such instance. So what you would want to do is you'd place the hallway here. And the reason being is because, I will explain in a sec, hold on. Cellar goes here as far as I remember. And it goes, well, let's put it to the side. It's not a very sensible layout, but I think it might actually be functional. Okay, so the study I think disappears at this point, doesn't it? So it says, discard each enemy in the study. Yes, so place each investigator in the hallway and remove the study from the game. So this is gone. We no longer need it. Let's place these a little further apart. So both Roland and Daisy are now in the hallway. And now we have multiple locations. It's not just one anymore. We have managed to get out of the study 
and that means we now have options to go to different locations. Hallway flavor text says, a moment of panic and disorientation strikes as you land upon the floor of the hallway. The world spins as if turned on its head. Flip the hallway, and it has zero investigation tokens on it, so we have nothing to... Why do I keep calling it investigation tokens? Clue tokens on it, and that means we cannot investigate this location to get clue tokens. So we'll have to move on if we want to advance the act deck. And it has a shroud value of 1 for whatever reason. I'm not entirely sure why it has a shroud value if you can't investigate. Uh, well, yeah, I don't know. The walls of your house are splattered with mud, and your hardwood floor is gone, replaced with a dirt path. Okay, so we're in the hallway. He's out of commission for this round. And now, as I mentioned before, the hallway has a symbol, and it's a white square with a red background. And then these symbols on the bottom tell you where you can move from the hallway. So the hallway has a matching symbol of the white square with the red background. And then if you want to move on from the hallway, you can only move on to locations that have these three symbols. That means that from the hallway, you can move to the attic, which is the triangle with the blue background. And there's nothing indicating that you cannot go into the attic from the hallway. You have free passage as far as I, as far as the game uh, communicates. Another place you can go to is the cellar because we have the cross here or the plus sign with the crimson background. And that is the symbol of the cellar. So you can move there as well. And you can also technically move to the parlor which is mm, sideways, no, diagonal square, definitely not the right term, but because the symbol's here, you can technically move there, but then if you look at the text box for the parlor, it says the entrance to the parlor is blocked by a darkly glowing, unfathomable barrier. You cannot move into the parlor, so that means that even though geographically there is um, passage from the hallway to the parlor, we are physically unable to enter it at this time, Later on, we will have the option to do so. So now, I am pretty sure that I have one action. Yes, I have one action left with Daisy. She's still not exhausted. Uh, oh, wait, hold on. Um, I didn't actually start the new act, so maybe I should do that. Actually, we don't need this anymore. So the next act card says the barrier. A glowing barrier blocks the path to your parlor. As you move toward it, intense heat forces you to back away. Picking up a handful of dirt, you toss it at the barrier and watch in horror as the dirt incinerates. Perhaps there's something in the cellar or the attic that can help. So the barrier that we were talking about earlier blocking the parlor is a magical arcane thing that we need to figure out how to get past in order to get in there. So it says... Objective, when the round ends, investigators in the hallway may, as a group, spend the requisite number of clues to advance. So if you'll notice, this is something new. This wasn't in the previous act um, as a disclaimer. So that means when you collect a clue during this act, you would place the clue on the investigator. Why? Because uh, if you notice, there is no clues here, so you won't be getting any clues in the hallway. And according to the objective, you can only spend clues in the hallway to advance the act. So in this particular instance, your investigator would have to carry the clues on his person. person. And once he gets to the hallway, he can then spend um, his clue tokens. And he needs to get up to, or they both need to get up to six um, in order to advance the act, because it says three times investigators, which is equal to six in this instance. So... For Daisy's last action, I think that it might be prudent to move on from the hallway, unless there's nothing, or there's something that I can play right now, which uh, I don't think any of these things are tremendously helpful at this point in time. So I'm going to have Daisy move to the attic. So we've moved to the attic with Daisy, which means that the lock symbol is no longer in effect, in the sense that we flip this card to reveal what lies beyond. First, we'll read the flavor text because we love flavor text. The smell of rotten meat assaults your nostrils as you approach the attic stairs. Boom. So we have the, 
we have to grab extra clue tokens because there's only two on there. And we're covering the beautiful illustrations on the card, which is not good, but whatever. So we now have four clue tokens here, and it says forced. After you enter the attic, take one horror. The bloody carcass of a malformed beast swings from a meat hook chained to the ceiling. Blood drains slowly from the carcass, dripping into a small barrel. Okay, so forced means something that happens no matter what. Um, unless you have something that strictly specifies that you can prevent the effect, which we have nothing like that right now, then forced goes into effect. So it, it's basically a... I like to think of it as a booby trap. I mean, you enter the attic and you take one horror. So we are going to take one horror and put it on poor Daisy. <clears throat> yes, well... I guess going into the attic can be a very traumatic experience when there's a carcass in there. Um, and so Daisy is a very, very, very sane person with a sanity point of nine. So she is down to eight right now, which is not alarming in the least um, because she has plenty to spare. But, you know, as the game goes on and this keeps happening, it, it, uh, it adds up. And uh, healing is, as you might have noticed, not one of the actions that you can do on your own. So... Healing is not easy. Um, there are ways, but we don't have any right now. And not only do we not have any right now, we don't have any without the um, assistance of a particular card that we draw. So we will have to be lucky in order to find something. Actually, you know what? I am lying because we have Medical Text by Roland, which gives you the action of choosing an investigator at your location to test your lore up against a value of 2. And if you get higher than two, if you if you succeed, heal one damage from that investigator. But if you fail, you deal one damage to that investigator. So that can be hmm, a double-edged sword, shall we say. But now, <clears throat> Daisy has moved. And she is in the attic. Which means that she is going to be exhausted. Now, also, um, the location cards have, some of the location cards, as well as the enemies, have this thing written on them, which, has, which says Victory 1. So, Victory 1 means if you end up exploring that location completely and clear all of the clues, or if you beat the enemy, which has the Victory 1 disclaimer on it, that means you get one experience point at the end of the scenario, which is used to get higher level cards and upgrade certain weapons and skills that you have in the game. And that's something we'll get to later. So both of our investigators are exhausted and now it's the enemy phase. So enemies with the under keyword move towards the nearest investigator, which there are none, and each engaged enemy attacks if able, which there are none. So we essentially get to skip the... Oh, you know what I just... <laughs> what I just realized... No, no, never mind. Sorry. My mistake. I thought I cheated, but I didn't, so that's good. Okay, so enemy phase is over, and now we have the upkeep phase, which is reset our investigators. So they're back in full swing. We give them one resource each. Daisy's still low on resources. She only has two, whereas Roland is pretty rich. He didn't spend a lot last round. And then during the upkeep phase, we also draw a card. And this is our second piece of healing equipment, which is a first aid. Also potentially a willpower boost if we so choose. Daisy gets a scrying, which isn't... Eh, it's really good for control, but I don't know if we're going to be using that. We'll see. So we drew all our cards... And I think that concludes the upkeep phase. None of us have more than eight cards in our hands, so that's a safe bet. And now, it's the mythos phase. And that means we place one Doom on the agenda. It's our first Doom, uh, one of three. Uh, if we get three, then we flip it, which hopefully doesn't... Uh, it will happen, but I mean, hopefully not soon. And once we did that, we now draw cards from the encounter deck in player order. So 
because Roland went first, he's going to draw the first card of the encounter deck and deal with whatever it might be. And it's an enemy. So we get to deal with swar Swarm of Rats right away. So Swarm of Rats spawns in the hallway. And that means because he doesn't have the aloof keyword, he engages Roland immediately. So right now, it's a good idea to put engaged enemies right in front of you in your threat area because you know you're dealing with them and you know that they're engaged with you. And so that was Roland's. The enemy doesn't do anything right now. Uh, it's going to do stuff in the enemy phase, as well as we can try and take it out during our turn. But when it appears, it's inactive until he gets a chance to attack. So it's, it's just engaged with us right now. It doesn't actually attack. So Daisy draws her encounter card. And <laughs> it's another swarm of rats. I did shuffle this. Um, so I don't know why I'm drawing two of these things in a row. It's because there's a probability that that would happen, even though it's low. But anyways, Daisy now has to deal with the rats too. So, okay. Well, that concludes the Mythos phase. Um, the only thing we skipped is checking the threshold, but I mean, I would have noticed that there was three. So that concludes the, the Mythos phase. So now we move on to the investigation phase. And this is where we have to think about what we do. The reason being is because Roland is now engaged with an enemy. So that means if he does anything other than fight, evade, or use a parley or resign action, the enemy attacks. Now the enemy has three stats. The middle, the brown background number, is the health of the enemy. So that's that's how much health you have to that's how much damage you have to deal to him to kill him. This one is the fist symbol, is obviously a strength, and that's going to be the value that you have to match when you do a strength test as you attack him in order to try and do damage to him and get past his defenses. And then three, which is the little foot with the wing symbol, is the evasion symbol. And similarly, that is the value that you have to match with your evasion stat, along with any other boost you might use, in order to evade the enemy. So if you evade the enemy, you essentially tap him for that round, which means he's not engaged with you. So he goes, he's still in the area, but he's not engaged with you. He's not, he's not a threat. You have bypassed him and gotten past his attention, I guess. And you get a round of reprieve until the upkeep phase of that round, at which point he refreshes and then becomes engaged with you again. But we didn't do that, so we're not going to tap him. Instead... I think we can probably take this guy with our knife. He's got a strength of one, we have a strength of four. So what I'm gonna do is declare an attack. He's got a health of one. So I only need to do one damage to him, which means I'm not gonna be throwing the knife at him. I'm just gonna be using the knife to get a plus one for this attack, plus one strength. So I have a strength value of four plus one with the knife going up against a one. And I still, unfortunately, have to draw from here, which I'm going to do. It's a minus 3, which puts me at 5 minus 3 is a 2 against a 1. So I still succeed, even despite the really crappy draw. Which means, because I won the strength test with the knife, I deal 1 damage to this guy, he dies. And he goes in the encounter deck discard pile, which is right here. So, as I mentioned before, Roland has a special ability that says after you defeat an enemy, you discover one clue at your location. And you have to limit this once per round. But, because there are no clues at my location right now, that means I unfortunately don't get that bonus. Which is kind of crappy, but I think we can deal with it. So that was <clears throat> Roland's fight action. And that means we have two more actions to go. I think... Actually, I know that the seller has a higher shroud, <clears throat> shroud value than the attic. So what I normally would want to do is get Roland to go to the attic because it's only a shroud of one and it's something he can probably tackle with his relatively lower, lower stat. And that's just what I'm going to do. I'm going to move Roland here. And unfortunately, I still 
take the one horror, because it's a forced effect that happens every time you enter the attic. So Roland Psyche has to take a hit here. And he only has five sanity points, so he's not as mentally robust as Daisy. He is, however, physically superior uh, in terms of durability, or uh, endurance, I should say. So Roland's down to four sanity. If he goes insane, um, by going down to zero or less sanity points, he's out of this particular game um, scenario, rather, because he suffers a mental trauma and he goes out of commission, so he, he will not be able to to assist with anything that happens. So let's hope that doesn't come to that. Roland's second action was to move here. Now his third action is going to be to investigate. So I'm going to use lore of three against the shroud of one. So I still have a pretty good chance of succeeding here. Minus minus x. x is the number of ghoul enemies your location, which there are none, because there's only a rat here. Which is not a ghoul, thankfully. So, I succeed. Oh, ooh, ooh, not what I'm trying to do. Lower, there we go. So we grab a clue, and remember we have to place them on our investigator card this time. Because we can only use them in the hallway to advance the act. So Roland <clears throat> has done his third action, which means he's out of commission. It's now Daisy's turn. And Daisy is currently engaged with an enemy. So, she doesn't have any weapons. Her evasion's two, and the enemy's invasion stat is a three, which is not that great. But she does have manual dexterity, which gives her an evasion boost, which could be really useful. Her strength is a two, going up against a one. So, I mean, it's... I don't know. She might be able to kill it. Eh, you know what? Let's take a chance. So she's essentially pretty weak. She has a strength uh, value of 2, but the rats are also very weak, and they have a strength value of 1. So I think I have a decent chance of su succeeding in this combat test fight action. And this is what I was talking about. So sometimes you would take a risk, and this would happen, where you draw minus 4 and utterly fail the test. So because I did a fight action and I didn't succeed, I don't deal any damage to the rat, but nothing bad happens. So if this rat would have the retaliate keyword along with hunter, then that would mean that every failed attack against the rats would result in a counter attack. So it would actually deal one damage to me. The enemies have these little symbols here and you see the red heart symbol. That means it deals one damage to you every time it attacks you. So, I think, I might be able to try and attack the rat again, and I think that's what I'm going to do. <clears throat> so I'm going to try and do strength test with Daisy, which is, again, a two versus one. And I'm going to draw from this thing. I shuffled it already. And it's a minus two, which puts me at one. No, which puts me at zero. Uh, okay, so I once again failed. I think maybe attacking with Daisy is probably not a wise course of action. But I keep hoping that I'm going to get really lucky and actually succeed. <clears throat> and I can't investigate right now because if I do, it counts as an action that qualifies for an attack of opportunity for the rats, which means they can take a swipe at me. So, I think that instead, what I'm going to do is try my luck again and see if I can kill him this time. Minus one. Okay, so that actually is a success because subtract one from two. Uh, going up against this one, that's one against one, and I matched it, which means I succeed. That means that the rats are finally out of commission. 
and that leaves me able to do other things like investigation, for instance. But Daisy is exhausted. I think that was her third action. It was. So we're done the investigation phase. We do the enemy phase, which there would have been one if I didn't kill the rats, but I did, so there's no enemy phase. <clears throat> Upkeep phase means we reset our cards. Take one resource each. And one card each. Okay, so... <laughs> Another thing I forgot to mention, every character has weaknesses. Um, every character has a unique weakness that is unique to his character that goes in their deck no matter what. And this is one of those cards. So Daisy's weakness is the Necronomicon, which is a fictional book about dark and occult lore in uh, Howard Phillips Lovecraft stories. <coughs> so when you draw a weakness, you have to deal with whatever it says right away. In this particular instance, it has a revelation, which means when you reveal this card, you have to do what it says right next to the revelation thing. So it says, you put the Necronomicon into play in your threat area with three horror on it. It cannot leave play while it has one or more horror on it. Treat each Elder Sign Chaos back token. You reveal on a Chaos token as a Red Tentacle token. So. The thing that would normally be good for Daisy, if she drew the Elder Sign, or normally good for any investigator, is actually terrible now. So in addition to the Red Tentacle token, that could immediately fail a challenge. We now have the Elder or she now has the Elder Sign token fail a challenge as well. And we're going to follow the instructions and put three Sanity, thing, uh, sanity uh, tokens on here. And as an action, we can move one horror from the Necronomicon to Daisy Walker. Then, if the Necronomicon has no horror on it, I can discard it. So we would have to sustain three horror in order to get rid of this weakness. <clears throat> and I'm not even sure that's worth it, because the chances of drawing the Elder Sign token are really slim. But it is still pretty early in the game, so... Hmm. I don't know. We'll keep it for now. I don't really have a choice anyways. So we've drawn all we could draw. And R Roland only has six cards in his hand. That's well below the permitted eight. So that was the upkeep phase. And then now we move on to the mythos phase. So we place one doom on the agenda and it's nearly advanced, which is bad. Not only that, we have to draw from the encounter deck now. So Roland went first. So he's going to draw. And he draws a really fun, really fun thing called Crypt Chill. So as a revelation, it says test your willpower against a stat of value of 4. If you fail, choose and discard one asset you control. If you cannot, take 2 damage instead. So basically, I have to test my willpower. And if I can match the four or get higher then I don't have to do anything and this thing goes away but if I don't match it and get something lower or if I instantly fail the test then I have to get rid of what asset I control which I only have one I have the knife and nothing else but that is good because if I didn't have the knife and I failed I would be taking two damage which is really hard to recover from and the knife isn't terribly terribly useful so anyway let's get the show on the road and let's see if I have anything to help me here first aid might come in handy later on and my willpower though is three so it's actually one below the four that is required to pass this test which is not good because there is only one car, or sorry, only one chaos token in here that could help me. No, two. One of them is the Elder Sign, which would boost, because of Roland's special ability, or uh, Elder Sign ability, it would boost my stats by three, because it says plus one for each clue token on your location, which is three. And then a plus one would also do it, but that's two out of 
a lot. I don't know how many there are in there right now. So it's a risk I shouldn't be taking. So instead, I'm going to throw this down. No, I don't need resources on here. This automatic thing is good, but sometimes not so good. So because I threw this down, I don't have to pay anything because I'm using it as as a stat boost for its icon, as I explained before. So it's another way of using cards is to just give yourself a one-time stat boost indicated in the icons on the side banner of the card. So I don't have to pay for it. It goes away. And I get one willpower just for this test. So it's a one-time thing. So right now I'm at four because I discarded this which is equal to what I need to match. But now, I also have to draw. And of course it's a minus three, which means I miserably failed. And that means I have to discard the knife. Um, st still not that bad. There are way nastier cards in there. <clears throat> so that was Roland. Now Daisy is drawing her encounter card, and it's Dissonant Voices. Revelation, put Dissonant Voices into play in your threat area. You cannot play assets or events. At the end of the round, discard Dissonant Voices. So, I mean, it's a one round thing, but it's still pretty annoying. Hmm. So that concludes the Mythos phase, I think. Yeah, that's it. So we're ready to do stuff now. Hmm. This is a pretty decent card too. It actually, when you investigate, you get plus one lore, which is always good to have, and it's fast, so it doesn't cost an action to play. So what I'm gonna do, <clears throat> as Roland's first action, spend one resource and get the magnifying glass out, which will help me investigate which I'm going to do right now. I'm going to use my next action to investigate, which means I'm going to put my lore stat of 3 plus 1 from the magnifying glass, which is a 4, up against the shroud of 1. And let me shuffle this thing just for good measure. Minus 1. 4 minus 1 is a 3. And it's well above the 1. So he gets yet another clue token. Still has one action left. So from the attic, you can only go to the hallway because that's the only symbol that is on the roster of available geographical locations that you can move on to from the place. <clears throat> and I feel like he should make his way to the cellar because we are going to need more clues than what is available here. So yeah, for the third action, I'm going to move to the hallway. That concludes Roland's turn. Now Daisy... Daisy has these things. Uh, dissonant voice. Put dissonant voice into play in your throne. You cannot play assets or events. So that limits what I can do this round considerably. I can still move. I can still investigate. I just can't play stuff from my hand. Most things, anyway. So I think... Um, I think I might have made a mistake, actually, because just remember that the seller has a high shroud value and Roland going there may not be the best idea, even with his boost. So maybe Daisy should go there. We'll have Daisy go to the hall, back to the hallway. And then she will go to the cellar as her second action. And we have four more clues here. Two times investigators, which is four. Your cellar seems to have been replaced with an underground network of icy tunnels and caverns. The cold chills you to the core. Take one damage after you enter. Well, it's not good for Daisy. So Daisy is now down to four health. But 
she has a pretty good chance of getting these glue tokens slightly better than Roland, even with his boost. This one is also worth an experience point if you explore the location thoroughly, meaning you get all of the clue points. So, for Daisy's third action, I suppose that I'm going to... I'm going to do an investigation, and of course I'm going to use my flashlight. So once again, the flashlight, if you spend one supply, your location gets minus two shroud for the investigation, which is going to be good because that puts it at a two against my five. Yeah, yeah, that's good. And here's the money shot. Minus one. Five minus one is four, uh, way higher than two, so we are good. Daisy grabs a clue. And that was the last action she could do. <clears throat> so minor hiccup, I moved Roland into the hallway. I should have done that. In fact, it was a considerably bad idea because now when he returns to the attic, he is once again going to take one horror. Yeah, very, very reckless and stupid move. But I'm not gonna backtrack and I'm not gonna cheat. So we'll just have to deal with it. Okay, well, uh, it is now the upkeep phase. It's not quite the end of the round, so that thing stays, but I mean, whatever. Upkeep phase will have me flipping these guys, and they are back in the game. They also get one resource each. Roland is rich, but he doesn't have stuff to buy. Well, he does, but I mean, nothing's particularly good. Whoa. Grab the whole deck there. Yes, so... In addition to unique weaknesses, characters also have unique assets. And Roland's .38 special is one of these assets, and it's a really powerful weapon that will come in handy, but not yet. I might play it anyway, but I don't think I'll use it. And the reason being is because it runs on ammunition, like most guns. And once you're out of ammo, unless you have something to replenish it with, you cannot use the item anymore, so. But this is good. This is definitely a good thing. And did I give Daisy a resource? I don't, I don't think I did. No, I think I did. We're just going to assume that I did. I mean, she has four anyways, and I'm not spending anything. But I know I didn't draw with her, so. Perception. Max, one committed per skill test at this this test is successful, draw one card. So this is a skill card, no cost. You just straightforward use it to get these two icon boosts. And if you succeed at the test with the icon boosts, you draw a card as well. So it's actually pretty useful. Okay, so that was the upkeep phase. And, wait, it doesn't have a, no, nowhere near. So now we do Mythos, we'll place one Doom on the agenda, and now there's three on there, so we advance it, and that's bad. Your house continues to change before your very eyes. The walls have decayed, and the ground in many rooms has turned to dirt. It is almost as if you have been transported somewhere else entirely, although every now and again you recognize elements of your former home. The lead investigator must decide. Choose one. Either each investigator discards one card at random from his or her hand, or the lead investigator takes two horror. Ooh. I think I'm going to go with the random discard, just because it's not a good idea to, to be sustaining horror or damage at this point for either character. So really hope we're not going to discard this because that would be terrible. There's only one in the deck of this particular card and we need it. So shuffle, 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 and the card that we're going to draw is the one that's being discarded, just to clarify. Good. Well, I mean, not really good because this is also a great card, but this one is now gone, sadly. We put the rest back here.
And we're going to have to do the same with Daisy stuff. Um, not that bad. I think we're okay. Okay. And was that it? Yeah, that, that was, uh, that was it. So we move on to the next agenda card. So this one has seven, which means it's going to take normally a longer time to advance. Although there are other cards that influence how many Doom tokens go on there per turn. <clears throat> so it says, the floor beneath you is giving way, and you see a vast network of tunnels twisting into the darkness below. Shapes and silhouettes of strange creatures move swiftly through the tunnels, trying to find a way up. You probably don't want to be here when they do, which is pretty much them opening a can of whoop-ass on us. That I hope will not happen, but it might. Okay, so let's carry on. So as I said before, Roland's going to go... Mm, wait, should Roland go first? Yes. Yes, he should. He has to go to the attic anyways. Unless... He might actually not have to go to the attic. Of course, that means we don't get the experience point. If we don't clear the attic of all the clues. But I mean, this thing's a... It's a tutorial anyways. So we'll, we can do without the experience point. Um... I think we can prioritize a little bit and have Roland pay three resources, two, three, to play a card, which is the gun. Interestingly, I think Roland paints a pretty good picture of himself right now with a magnifying glass in one hand and then a .38 in the other. But hey, it might still be a good setup for the rest of the game, I hope. <clears throat> so it was Roland's first action. And now I think I'm gonna have him stay there. And maybe maybe I can draw a card. Eh, why not? So we'll as an action I'm gonna draw a card. And I have guts, which is also pretty useful when there's a willpower test anyway. And that was his second action. So for his third action, <clears throat> I'm going to prepare for what's to come and draw another card. Because I happen to know that there's a particularly nasty development right around the corner. Mind over matter. So this one's a pretty decent card as well. So that concludes Roland's turn. Daisy's here now in the cellar. And we have two clues on Roland and one on Daisy. Which means if Daisy's able to somehow get all three of these, we have enough clues to actually go to the hallway and advance the act without necessarily going to the attic, too. So, is there anything else that can help me investigate? Yes, there is. There are, in fact, plenty of things. So, for Daisy's first action, I'm going to spend the last unit of battery on my flashlight. To reduce the shroud value by two, which puts it at two. And Daisy has a lower five, so five on two. Let's hope for the best. Minus three. So five minus three is two, which means I matched it, which is enough, good enough rather, to grab another clue. By the way, this thing is now out of play, which I forgot to remove. And Daisy has two more actions, hopefully both of which will yield clue tokens, because that's what we need. And this one's really good, because not only does it give you two lore stat boosts for no cost, but if you succeed with the test, you also get to draw a card, so that's really useful. But now I no longer have a functioning flashlight because the batteries ran out, and that means that the shroud is, is going to be four now. And I only have one 
point of surplus. And if I throw this down, it gives me two more. It puts me at seven. Seven against four. I think we have a pretty solid chance. So, shuffle it again. And we get a plus one. That is wonderful. So we have passed it with flying colors, which means we throw it away and draw a card as a result. And she finally has a tome. That's good. And that yields us another clue. Oh, no, no, no. Not putting it there. <laughs> now, I just have to pass this last lore test and we can advance the act, which would be tremendously fantastic. So I'm going to give it all I've got and throw both of these for their lore boost value. So my final investigation is putting me at 7 versus 4. <laughs> I just shuffled and I got the plus 1 again. It must be fate. I am a lucky bugger. That is what I am. And that means... Oh, I'm getting over anxious again. So she now has 4 clue tokens, which is fantastic. But that was her last action. So <clears throat> both of these guys are exhausted now. And because we can only um, spend clue tokens to advance the act in the hallway, we will have to wait, unlike last round or last act, where we could just place it on there immediately and, and uh, advance it. We will now have to wait until next round. That's okay. So now we do the up uh, enemy phase. There's no enemies. Now we do the upkeep. Flip both of these guys. Everybody gets a resource, you get a resource, and you get a resource. And then we draw a card. Physical training, that is really good too. Um, Roland's getting the perfect cards at the best time right now. And Daisy, I don't know, not so much. She gets a magnifying glass. Well, that's not really needed, but that's okay. And now we go to the Mythos phase, take a Doom token and put it on the agenda. It's one out of seven. Still doing pretty good. And then, of course, we draw according to player order, which is Roland first, gets his first encounter card. Rotting Remains. Revelation test willpower against a score of three. For each point you fail by, take one horror. Well, this is particularly nasty. But... You remember we just drew guts a little while back and this is going to come in really handy right now because Roland's willpower is a three and we have to pass a three which normally I mean we match it but of course we're going to be drawing from the chaos book and more, more than likely we're going to draw something that's going to negatively impact it so I'm definitely using guts because I think I might not get a better chance to utilize this than this I don't want to be taking horror damage with Roland he's already taken one so this gets, gives me the two willpower boosts, which puts me at five. And if I succeed, I draw a card and I don't have to pay for it. So that's fantastic. Now I'm five against three. Oh, that is amazing. But uh, it doesn't really impact me at all. So it's a, <clears throat> this is the Elder Sign token, by the way. And thank God that Roland drew that and not Daisy, because for Daisy, that is really bad right now. So he drew it, which means plus one for each clue on your location. Roland has zero clues on his location, but that's okay because we are already two above the crucial requirement. And that means that Guts is gone. We pass the test and we don't lose any sanity. And we draw a card, thanks to Guts. And it's a flashlight. Uh, don't really have space for it right now, but that's okay, because I don't need to. <clears throat> and that was Roland's encounter. Let's see what Daisy draws. Oh, not this thing again. It's Dissonant Voices, so for one round, it's, it's going to prevent me from playing cards, pretty much. I think skills I can still play, but assets and events are off limits, so... 
cannot play assets or events. Yeah, just for the one round. That's okay. Um, that concludes the mythos phase, and now we begin the investigation phase. So we're going to have... This time, I'm going to elect Daisy to go first, instead of Roland. And... You will see why in a second. Because right now, Roland is in position to use his two clues to advance the act from the hallway, which is a requirement for the objective. But Daisy is still stuck in the cellar. So if I were to do Roland first, I would have to conclude my both of my investigators' turns with just advancing the act and then potentially having one or two actions left for Daisy. But the player or the lead investigator, rather, in this game, has the ability to decide who goes first. Which investigator, rather. So I'm going to have Daisy go first and move right to the hallway. And then... It doesn't cost an action to spend the clues to advance the act. You just have to be physically in the hallway. So we're going to do that right away. I'm going to take one, two, three, four... Five, six. So we place it on the act. Well, pretend to anywhere. And we advance. Using the barrel from the attic, you carry ice and snow from the cellar and hurl it at the barrier. The barrier sparks and shudders as it consumes the ice, then hisses and fades out of existence. The barrier blocking passage into the parlor has vanished. Reveal the parlor. Okay. Parlor is now open. Put the set aside Lita Chandler into play at the parlor. So we now have a friendly NPC up here in one of the locations. And this is pretty neat. I actually like this game mechanic a lot. <clears throat> so if you go to the parlor where Lita is right now, and Lita is an ally, she has a little investigator token, which means she can technically go to this spot or Daisy's same spot. And she, amongst other things, is a meat shield. So a lot of allies have the ability to sustain damage for you because they have health points and sanity points. So whenever an enemy would attack you or you would take damage for whatever reason, you could actually distribute that damage and allocate it any way you want, even delegating it to your allies. So if you were to suffer three health damage could technically put two on Lita, one on yourself, and then Lita would still survive. And you would only take one damage because she shields you from some of the harm. So it's actually really useful. Um, there is splash damage, however. So if you were to suffer four health damage and she only had three health, she could block three of that damage for you, but you're still going to suffer the leftover one, which I don't think makes any sense, but them's the rules. So, but besides being a meat shield, Lita also has a really good ability. It says, when an investigator at your location successfully attacks a monster enemy, that investigator deals plus one damage. So that is actually super, super useful. But you don't immediately have her. So she actually doesn't join you right away. When you go to the parlor, you have two options as actions. So one of them is resign. It says, this is too much for me. You run out the front door fleeing in panic. And then the other one is while Lita Chandler is not controlled by a player, which is right now, she gains, as an action, you can parlay with her, test her lore against a value of four. If you succeed, take control of Lita Chandler. So you actually have to do a lore test and get four or higher when you're in the same location as her to get her to join you. Which also kind of makes sense if you think about it. I mean... This is a strange woman in a in a very dangerous place, which happens to be her home. I'm not sure what she's doing there, but she obviously isn't going to join you right away and is going to be very suspicious when you show up, even though this is your home. So she shouldn't be. You should be suspicious of her. But anyway, we're going to leave that for later. That was the act of advancing. Oh. There's a third one that I almost didn't notice. It says, spawn the set-aside ghoul priest in the hallway. So this lovely creature now visits us. 
And this guy is the boss of this scenario. Essentially, he is the strongest enemy. Um, he, he has a strength of four, which is fantastic. That's pretty strong for an enemy. A health of five times investigators, which is five times two is 10. So he's 10 health and an evasion of four. So it's really hard to get past this guy without him noticing you. And his prey is the highest strength. The prey means when an enemy spawns and there are investigators in his location, his prey it determines who he favors to engage first. So because there are two investigators here, it's not obvious who he would engage, because, but because he has the prey keyword and it says highest strength, we now know that he is going to be wanting to engage Roland first. So that's what he does. He's also a hunter, so he comes after you every enemy phase, moves one spot towards you, and he has retaliate to make things worse. So every failed assault on this guy is going to result in him attacking you, and just look at the damage he does. He's got two damage and two sanity every time he attacks you, or every time he retaliates, which is just ridiculous. This guy's a menace, and he's engaged with Roland. Just what the hell am I going to do? He's got a lot of health, too. I can't really take him out easily. Now, Roland's .38 special is great because if you spend one ammo as a fight action, you get plus one strength for the attack. And then if there are one or more clues on your location, you get plus three instead. And then the attack deals plus one damage. So it deals two damage for every successful shot bullet. But if you'll notice, there are no clues at our location right now. The attic is the only place that has clues. And of course, because he's engaged with me, if I move to the attic, not only will he follow me to the attic immediately and automatically, he will also get to take a swipe at me. And a single swipe by this guy is like death. Not really. Um, I could survive, I think, one. But the second one will kill me. So it's... That's just mind-blowingly dangerous. I'm trying to look at my cards here to see if there's anything that will come in handy, but <sighs> Roland is not good at evading. He's got an evasion of two. And I only have, well, I have two cards that actually help in evasion. Three cards. So I can potentially boost my evasion by three, putting me at a five against a four. It's not terrible, but if I fail that, I'm going to have wasted a lot of cards, and I don't know if I shouldn't just attack this guy with my gun instead. I mean, that will... I'll have five strength against this four. This is not tremendously great. <clears throat> I would love to evade him, though, just because it would buy me some time, so it would be really nice if Daisy had a good evasion stat. She does, however, have man manual dexterity, which can help her. But it'll only put her at a four. And, no, I can, I can play skills. Or is that gone now? That was last turn, wasn't it? So, trying to strategize here. Um... Okay, so I've made up my mind. This is what I'm going to do. Because Daisy can also fight, but she doesn't have any weapons to do it with. And it's risky to fight with her. I'm going to have Daisy, because she's not engaged, go first. So Daisy's going to go first. Hold on there. <laughs> Am I skipping the Mythos phase? Because I'm pretty sure... Yeah, hold on. I'm pretty sure that that was... Us... No, 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 no. No, this is still the player phase. My bad. I forgot that we just restarted. So, <laughs> sometimes the phases confuse me in this game. But yeah, so I'm in the player phase. I, For some reason, I started getting alarmed and thought I skipped a Mythos phase, which happened once before. 
and it was a really, really awful feeling because I don't want to be cheating at all. It really takes away from the whole victory aspect of the game. So, yeah, Daisy moved up here. <clears throat> that was her first action from the seller. And then we spent the clue tokens, which didn't cost an action. So now Daisy is going to move into the parlor. That's her second action. Now she's in the same place as Lita, and she can parlay. So she's going to test her lore and see if we can get her to join us. Um, should I throw this down? Boost my chances of winning this particular thing? Yeah, maybe I should. Because I'm not going to need magnifying glass right now anyway. So I throw down a magnifying glass to get the icon effect, which means I don't have to pay for the cost, and I just get a lore boost, a single point of lore boost, which puts me at 6. So now, she's at 6, and I have to pass a 4 in order to get Lita to join me. Shuffle this thing again. Minus 4 puts me at 4, and that means I matched the required number, and that means Lita is now my friend. So she has become an ally. It says, each investigator at your location gets plus one strength, which is amazing. And when an investigator at your location successfully attacks a monster enemy, which this guy is a monster, it says right there on straights. So we deal plus one damage to him. But the downside is that Daisy is now exhausted and stuck in the parlor while Roland is going to have to deal with the ghoul priest in the hallway. And once Roland does his three actions, and it's the enemy phase, if he doesn't evade him or kill him, and there's I don't think there's any way he can kill him, the ghoul priest is going to attack at least once. And if Roland does attack and does not match the strength required to actually do damage to this guy, he will retaliate, and that means he will probably kill Roland. Because one retaliation and one attack, Roland can't handle both. So, we got some tough choices. And I think this is actually a good time to call it quits for tonight. We've given a brief in introduction to the game, explained some of the rules, and I'm going to keep this video for my records as well, just so uh, we can refer to it later. Um, and then I think it might even serve as a decent tutorial despite my abundant mistakes because I did cover some ground and we also had like a trial run, which I intend to finish later on this week. So tune in next time. Um, I'm going to be finishing this scenario. I'm going to save it right now. We'll just call it Arkham Horror Twitch. So we're going to pick up right where we left off. Um, hopefully you enjoyed my first stream. Uh, I was a little nervous, definitely, and I made some mistakes, so I apologize for inconsistencies and hiccups and losing track of what phase I was in. Uh, that's kind of a recurring theme for me. Maybe I should have something to keep track of stuff. Speaking of which, I think that it might be a good idea to write down exactly what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> when I open this game, I I, uh, I need a cue. So I'll say, Roland's first turn. That's a neat little thing you can do in the tabletop as well. How about white? Because I'm not a big fan of yellow. So now we have everything here that we need. <clears throat> and next time we play, we're going to find out what happens to Roland and Daisy as they try to escape the clutches of the ghoul priest. Hopefully get rid of them too. Because um, technically you could resign and escape. But that will have detrimental effects on later scenarios in the campaign. Well, at least we have lead on our side. So that's actually a really useful thing. Would have been nice to have her back in the hallway too. Helping out. But maybe next time. Hopefully we'll, uh, 
we'll give you some entertainment that time around too. Anyways, see you next time, and thank you for tuning in, and thanks for bearing with me. (laughs) 